Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, event. Uh, my name is Aidan Regan. I'm an associate professor at the School of Politics and the International Relations. I'm very pleased and privileged to chair this event on behalf of the IIEA with Professor Noam Chomsky. <clears throat> so uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for your participation for this, uh, this fantastic event. Um, I think Professor Noam Chomsky doesn't quite need an introduction. <laughs> I think we all know uh, how influential and how an important intellectual uh, Professor Chomsky is. I think it's fair to say that Professor Noam Chomsky is one of the most, if not the most influential public intellectuals in the world. I think up there with the likes of Jürgen Habermas. His writings are extraordinarily prolific. I think uh, it's fair to say that you have quartered over a hundred books, authored over a hundred books at this stage, Professor Chomsky, and in addition to various essays and other contributions and, and interviews. But Professor Chomsky is also a renowned scholar, <clears throat> a renowned academic in, in the social sciences and particularly a scholar of linguistics, but his research in linguistics has influenced so many other intellectual fields of inquiry from cognitive science to even political science, political economy, uh, to philosophy, intellectual history, and, and much further afield. Um, but I think perhaps Professor Chomsky, you're most known or most famous for your investigations and your research uh, uh, on, and writings on US foreign policy. Uh, and you've exposed so much and informed the world so much about what goes on effectively or made public or made uh, visual what is quiet in effect, uh, particularly not least in terms of what's happening in Latin America and much further afield. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you to give your address uh, uh, here. We, Professor Chomsky will speak for 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then we will open it up for a Q&A session. Please send your questions through to the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. I think most people are probably familiar with using Zoom at this stage. I will collate those questions. Please state your name and your affiliation, uh, and hopefully we will be able to, to get to those questions. But um, Professor Chomsky, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin with a brief summary of what I'd like to say, then some comments to elaborate on a few highlights. Uh, we live at a uh, unique historical moment. It's the first time in human history that we face a confluence of severe challenges some so severe that failure to address them will soon effectively terminate organized human society with mass destruction of other species as well. The two most prominent are global heating, nuclear war, threats that are increasing in intensity. There are lesser ones that are lethal as well. So take the current pandemic it's already killed more Americans than the terrible flu epidemic a century ago, and it has not run its course. It's well understood that failure to vaccinate globally is not only a moral scandal, but also facilitates mutations that may escape control. Uh, there are other crises looming, new pandemics, Antibiotic resistant bacteria may make surgery impossible in another generation. Destruction of agricultural land and habitats, it's all too easy to continue. In another dimension, dissolution of the social order and of an atmosphere of rational interchange undermines efforts to address the challenges that we face. There's also good news. The good news is that for every one of the crises, the severe crises that humans face at this historically unprecedented moment, for every one, feasible solutions are at hand. The unanswered question is whether humans have the moral, intellectual capacity to choose a course towards a much better world. There are many issues here that require elaboration. One has to do with the roots of the crises. It's a very far reaching question, but there's a narrow one that can also be 
imposed. Uh, to what extent have the crises been exacerbated by the reigning socioeconomic doctrines of recent years, past 40 years of the neoliberal era? Uh, quite a lot, I think. But we have to be clear about what neoliberalism is. You check the internet, you find a conventional definition, quoting it, a political approach that favors free market capitalism, deregulation, and reduction in government spending. That's the definition. A look at practice shows that it's very far from reality. Keeping to practice, neoliberalism, I think, was much better described by the president of the United Auto Workers in the United States since 1978. He pulled out of a labor management conference organized by President Carter. Uh, this was just as the neoliberal wave was beginning to gather force. It was soon to peak with Reagan and Thatcher. Fra uh, Fraser in his withdrawal condemned business leaders, I'll quote him, condemned business leaders for having chosen to wage a one-sided class war in this country a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, minorities, the very young and the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society, and having broken and discarded the fragile unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress. That's the New Deal years went through the early 70s, golden age of capitalism, as many economists describe it. Well, I think the phrase one-sided class war captures the essence of neoliberal capitalism, and I think accounts for a large part of current malaise. A lot more to say about that, but I'll turn instead to the two truly existential crises global heating, nuclear war. So let's start with the first. On August 9th, as I'm sure you know, the IPCC, IPPC, released its latest report, by far the most dire yet. Conclusion was stark and clear. We must begin, we must begin right now to reduce fossil fuel use increasingly every year, so that we will effectively phase out fossil fuels by mid-century. The alternative to that is cataclysm. So how has the international political class reacted? Begin with the United States. Uh, the Biden administration is a vast improvement over Trump. Nevertheless, the day after the IPCC report, Biden appealed to OPEC to increase production. The US Congress right now is debating legislation, which at first included some measures to mitigate the disaster. They've been eliminated. Republicans are 100% opposed. The swing votes are the so-called moderate Democrats, particularly the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, who happens also to be the champion of the Congress in receiving funds from fossil fuel industries, which is quite a feat considering their scale. That's Joe Manchin. He's announced his position clearly. It's lifted directly from the public relations departments of ExxonMobil and its associates. The slogan is, no elimination, only innovation. So maintain fossil fuel production uh, without any 
uh, ceasing at all. Well, blocking of legislation that would harm the fossil fuel industry is not a malady specific to the United States. As we're meeting, the major world powers are joining Washington in pressuring oil producers to increase production. Petroleum industry journals are euphoric about the discovery of new fields to exploit as demand for oil increases. Turn to the business press. It's debating whether the US fracking industry or OPEC is best place to increase production. They all know that they're racing to catastrophe. And furthermore, at least if they're literate, they all know that there are feasible solutions to the climate crisis, which will furthermore create a more livable world. But profit for the rich and political expediency come first. That's true neoliberal doctrine, of course, has deeper roots. Well, let's turn to briefly to international affairs. I'll keep to one example, the most important current one, I think. The China threat, as it's called, is now escalating, conflict is escalating on a path that might well lead to terminal nuclear war. It's worth a careful look. Well, first of all, the United States is, of course, far in the lead in global military power, swamps all potential adversaries combined. It's also well ahead in the mad race to develop even more dangerous weapons and to extend our yearning for global suicide extended to space. The United States has incomparable security, but that's not a, how it's perceived in high places. The gravest perceived threat to the United States is China. So what then is the threat of China? Well, the China threat is well described by distinguished <coughs> international diplomat, Paul Keating, former prime minister of Australia, right within reach of the dragon's claws. So I'll quote his words. The fact that somehow the rise of 20% of humanity from abject poverty into something uh, approaching a modern state is illegitimate. That's the China threat. And more than that, by its mere presence, it's an affront to the United States. It's not that China presents a threat to the United States, something China has never articulated or delivered. Rather, its mere presence represents a challenge to United States preeminence. My own view is that's the essence of the China threat. Well, the main point of contention right now is what's called freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. That's how it's described. It's not accurate. More accurately, the conflict concerns military and intelligence operations in China's exclusive economic zone. The US holds that such operations are permissible in all such exclusive zones. China holds that they are not. India agrees with China's interpretation. It vigorously protested recent US military operations in its exclusive zone. Well, these exclusive zones were established by the 1982 Law of the Sea. The United States is the only maritime power that has not ratified the law. It asserts it will not violate it. 
the law, if you read it, bans the threat or use of force in the exclusive zones, it's borrowing the words of the UN Charter. The controversy has nothing at all to do with freedom of navigation. It's not threatened in the least. It has to do with whether military intelligence operations constitute a threat of force. Surely that's a clear case where diplomacy is in order, not highly provocative acts like sending in a big naval armada in a region of considerable tension with the threat of escalation, possibly without bounds. But it is crucial <coughs> to establish US preeminence everywhere, even off the coasts of China, which unlike the United States, we are led to believe faces no threats, uh, surely not from the nuclear armed missiles in US military bases off China's coasts. These are among the <coughs> 800 US military bases around the world. China has one in Djibouti. The nature of the China threat is further elaborated by Australia's preeminent military correspondent, Brian Tui. And it's worth quoting in detail to help understand world affairs. So I'll quote him. China's nuclear weapons are so inferior that it couldn't be confident of deterring a retaliatory strike from the United States. Take the example of nuclear powered ballistic missile armed submarines. China has four. Each can carry 12 missiles, each with a single warhead. Uh, according to the, the subs are easy to detect because they're very noisy. According to the US Office of Naval Intelligence, each is noisier than a Soviet submarine first launched in 1976. Russian and US subs are now much quieter. China is expected to acquire another four that are a little quieter by 2030. However, the missiles on the subs won't have the range to reach the continental United States. They would have to reach suitable locations in the Pacific Ocean. However, they are effectively bottled up inside the South China Sea to escape. They have to pass through a series of checkpoints, choke points, where they could be easily sunk by US hunter killer nuclear submarines. In contrast, the United States has 14 missile armed subs, Ohio class, each can launch 24 Trident missiles, each containing eight independently targetable warheads able to reach anywhere on the globe. That means a single US submarine can destroy 192 cities, other targets anywhere on the globe, that's one submarine, compared to 12 for the Chinese submarine. But that's not good enough. The Ohio class is now being replaced by the bigger Columbia class. Well, to write this imbalance, the United States is now sending Australia advanced hunter killer nuclear subs, which Australia will pay for, though they'll be incorporated in the US Naval Command. The sale of advanced nuclear subs abrogates a France-Australia agreement for sale of conventional subs. It's a serious blow to French industry. Washington did not take the trouble even to notify France that instructs the European Union on its place in the US run global order. TUI observes further that Australia's submission to the United States does not enhance its security, quite the contrary. 
and he observes further that the nuclear subsail has no discernible strategic purpose. The subs will not be operable uh, for over a decade. By that time, China will surely have expanded its military forces to deal with this new military threat. The sub agreement does serve a purpose, however. It establishes more form firmly that the United States intends to rule the world, even if that requires escalating the threat of war, possibly terminal war in a highly volatile region. And of course, eschewing such sissified measures as diplomacy, not for tough guys like us. Well, these steps to escalate conflict take place against a background that's plain and stark. The United States inherited the mantle of global dominance from Britain, substantially extending its reach. China's arising power bound to play a major role in world affairs. The crises we face are international. Pandemics, destruction of the environment, no, no borders, nor does nuclear war. The United States and China will either cooperate in addressing these crises or we are doomed. Cooperation is surely achievable, just as the other crises we face have solutions that are within reach. The question we face is whether we can have the will to save ourselves from cataclysm. Always tempted in these conditions to reflect on Fermi's paradox, famous paradox. In grief, where are they? Fermi's discipline of astrophysics demonstrates that there's a vast number of planets accessible to us with conditions similar enough to life on Earth, on to, to Earth, so that they should be able to support life over time, intelligent life, maybe super intelligent life. So where are they? With the most dilig diligent search, we cannot find the slightest hint of their existence. Well, one possible answer is that intelligent life developed but proved to be a lethal mutation and quickly destroyed itself. We know of only one case of intelligent life, humans on Earth. We're a new species, a few hundred thousand years old, the blink of an eye in evolutionary time. Well, with these thoughts in mind, we can return to the crises we now face. We know how to overcome them. Do we have the will to do so? Or will we choose to show that higher intelligence really may be a lethal mutation, providing an unhappy answer to Fermi's paradox? Thank you. Thank you.